All right, so we're going to get started with our second plenary session. So this session is titled PEVA, Weaving Ancestral and Contemporary Technologies, Indigenous Data Hubs. This next exciting presentation will share updates on a new technology being developed at UH West Oahu's CreateX Lab through presentations, including video presentations by Tracy Bui, Hawaii Data Science Institute Fellow and Graduate Research Assistant at the Laboratory for Advanced Visualization and Applications, also known as LAVA. Please give a hand for Tracy. We'll also have Ulukoa Duhe Lansad by video, who is an archaeologist and ethno-historian at Kauiki Okapo. Please give a hand for Ulukoa. We also have Marissa Hallam, research assistant at LAVA at UH Manoa. Please welcome Marissa. Shailen Liu, UH Manoa computer science junior and indigenous data hub fellow. Please welcome Shailen. And finally, we have Kari Noe, Indigenous Technology Specialist, UH System Office of Indigenous Knowledge and Innovation. Please welcome Kari. So, hello, Kako. Thank you all. Um, mahalo for being here today again and for taking the time. I, to be present with us as we ho'ike, or we show outwardly the different facets of what OIK is working on. Um, we're gonna highlight now the second um, PICO, or the second initiative that um, the Office of Indigenous Knowledge was able to stand up. We acknowledge that the Center for Indigenous Innovation and Health Equity is what we call the Hiapo, the oldest. It's the firstborn, and if you're a parent, <laughs> the firstborn kid, oh, you, they teach you as much as you teach them, I think. Um, but to note that it is not only happening in Hawaii, this is actually changing narratives within the Office of Minority Health nationally, and that is also going on across, in, across Indian country. That part of society is really, um, we were trying to get into these spaces to reposition the mental model of what indigeneity is, um, and that the health equity, as you can see, wasn't just around human health, but ecosystem health, and that is a major distinction of Hawaiian thinking, that when we think health, we automatically think about humans. Um, our ecosystems that support us. So this second PICO I'm going to introduce you. And you also notice that we're all, OIKI is committed to leadership. So we've made Rochelle <laughs> our director and we put our next generation leadership in charge of work because I've only ever worked in spaces that share risk and that make sure that mentoring is vertical. Um, I want to also introduce our next leader, um, Kari Noy. The things that Kari will be sharing is part of a practice I was super lucky to um, come into in working with the National Science Foundation, EPSCoR. She'll talk a little bit about it. But the general idea that what I think IDH, the Indigenous Data Hubs, hold is how do we take our ancestral practices and bring them into contemporary spaces to provide tools to practitioners and students so they can, of a community, deeply understand what's happening there, what's happening, how the aina in their society, in their, in their, eco, in their area worked and functioned. This goal of not just building students, but building citizens. And then concurrently investing in regional practitioners who are doing aina work to give them tools necessary to move what was once anecdotal to very hard data points on the efficacy and the viability of their work. And all of this is because Kari has developed an incredible practice in, in, in what she's done and she's allowed us to be a part of this practice to build out this space. So I'm gonna turn it over to this team to talk about the work, mahalo. Aloha, so for our session, it's gonna be a little bit different. We're gonna be giving a presentation that, rather than a panel. And so um, if we could bring up the presentation up there, mahalo, and so uh, our presentation is going to be called uh, Weaving Ancestral and Contemporary Technologies. I've been serving as the Indigenous uh, Technology Specialist at the Office of Indigenous Knowledge and Innovation. And also I've been uh, a PhD research assistant at the Laboratory for Advanced Visualization Application. I'll be giving the background and concepts. The second is an overview of the related technology. So we're going to be talking about this technology called the Makavalu Visualization Environment, which has been a project that has been had many hands touch it. 
And so I'll be talking about an editor version. Tracy will be talking about the presenter and author version. And Marissa's going to be talking about some of the um, components that we've been building because this we'll get into it. The technology is modular. And then uh, we're going to end. We're going to end with the practice and technology in action. So we're going to watch a video um, from Ulukwa. Ulukwa do Halen Sad is a Pumuhula, an archaeologist who was supposed to be here today, but um, he actually is participating in the UN uh, Climate Change Council. I'll, he'll say it in his video where he is, but we were able to get uh, get his thoughts uh, on video. So a little sneak peek into what you guys actually can see back here is that this is um, our project table, which essentially we call the architecture, the project table, which essentially is the Basically, we, we point a projector down onto a table, and we use that projection to augment um, 3D topographic models of different areas. So this is a sneak peek into um, Shaylin's project, but we'll get more into that. Um, but the software that we use behind it is called the Makuvalu Visualization Environment. So talking about, Hawaii, as I mentioned, Hawaii EPSCore. So the Hawaii EPSCore funds um, usually a themed project every five years. This year was about climate resiliency, which is why the project is titled Change Hawaii. Um, part of that funding goes to a bunch of different um, projects, but for our project that um, Office of Indigenous Knowledge and Innovation was included in was seed funding. And for that seed funding project, there we were given basically two, um, two priorities that we had to meet. The first was that um, we had to help contribute to the data science, innovation, and technology transfer here in Hawaii. And then also we had to help with the inclusion of Native Hawaiian Pacific Islanders um, and in, in the inclusion and equity in, the da in Hawaii's data science endeavor. Um, so me and Kamuela kind of took those two lines and ran, and we made uh, what became the Indigenous Data Hub um, project. So let's talk about the practice. So you guys uh, probably have seen this from um, Kamu's presentation. Usually me and Kamu um, give this presentation at the same time, but when we were thinking of um, how to meet basically these, this thought of having regional students enter this ecosystem of innovation and have the outputs be 21st century citizens, we started to think through of how can structures that when we think of what we have to meet for the seed funding for the EPSCOR, we use in a way so that we can create this ecosystem for students to both learn and um, develop data science skills, but also, more importantly, learn skills about indigenous design practice, learn, uh, have experiences where they can connect with their own communities, and be able to have a space to understand how their skills can actually be, be applicable and impactful to their communities. And so this is when we started trying to think of what an indigenous-centered data visualization practice is. And uh, when I usually talk about that, I want to focus and kind of give a definition of what indigenous-centered is. Um, at OIKI, we focus on indigenous-centered because, and just indigenous rather than native Hawaiian, because we believe that we really want to focus on the ways in which we can um, honor ancestral practice no matter where your ancestry um, comes from. So when I say what does indigenous-centered mean, um, typically what we've been uh, working with under, the definition we've been working under, at least the key question that we ask ourselves to define what indigenous-centered means is what does your practice optimize for? Because for us, we center on the optimization of abundance and health for a community, and that is interwoven into the design and practice of the research that we develop and the co-design methodologies and the technologies that go through this, um, we develop through uh, this project. So when we were developing the practice, I won't go too deeply into this framework, but it's called the Equitable Co-Design Framework um, with Indigenous Communities. And essentially, this is a framework specifically for te uh, technology design. And so what it is is that you have the basic steps of a typical um, development process or design process where you, you get requirements, you design, you create a prototype, and you get feedback. So from how this framework um, works is that at each point, you are thinking through guiding questions of how um, basically from the get-go, from the start of designing the design practice, you are thinking about pos positionality, locality, ways in which you can bring equity into the communities that you're building with. 
I started actually developing this framework um, when I was a master's student because I actually got my start from uh, going to Bishop Museum exhibits department and saying, if I work for free, <laughs> will you teach me? <laughs> what do you guys know? And they were very friendly and they did, uh, uh, they did especially Michael Wilson, uh, let me work on a couple of projects. But working with the museum, I started to think, okay, w how do these exhibits and how can we extend these exhibits outside of the traditional like structure of a museum to help communities? Because we can see how it can be important because it's access to knowledge, but at the same time, it's kind of walled into the typical museum structure, which is hard, can be hard to uh, be accessible to communities. So this leads us to the indigenous data hubs. So again, one of the most important places that um, this idea sprang from is uh, CreateX, which as I mentioned, is the Emerging Media Lab at the Academy for Creative Media at the University of Hawaii West Oahu. I've had the joy of being able to manage this lab um, since 2020. And um, now, from all of the um, projects we've been working on, we've been thinking about how immersive technology, so this is like AR, augmented reality, virtual reality technologies, can aid in the creation of these kinds of experiences, visualizations, and basically visceral um, reactions from what we are showcasing in, uh, through these kinds of technologies. And we're thinking through how can this be beneficial and helpful to our communities. And so uh, Kamu and I developed this IDH working model. So our overall goal is localized resilience and innovation. And we see three ways to get there. The first is through student development. The second is through the um, implementation of applied research. And the third is through um, community investment. This, excuse me, translates into three pillars that we have for, that make up the um, indigenous data hub ecosystem. The first are the hub sites. So these are the physical location, locations like CreateX where um, these kinds of visualization technologies, places for communities to commune and for students to learn are. The second are student development programs, which I'll talk more about what are, what, uh, are the structure of it. But student development programs, so students can participate in this kind of research design and community connections. And third is technology sharing. We really want to think of how does this research and um, innovation ecosystem structure actually allow us to be, uh, give um, reciprocity and equity to the community. So often, I'll talk a little bit more about the model. All the technology that we um, develop, we, have, um, we develop into kits so that they can be shared out into community and be co-designed to work with their practice. So for specifically the student development projects, um, the main components of them is one, a specifically named Aina, two, the students of that Aina, three, the ancestral knowledge and practice that are from that Aina, and four, the community organizations and practitioners that have continued to perpetuate those ancestral practices in that Aina. Through those four main components, we try, um, those are the uh, lay the groundwork for how we develop the experience that students have in our student development projects and how we, uh, we approach co-design. The thought is that, for instance, um, we create X as an Evomoku, so we focus on Evomoku. We focus, and when we um, did our first cohort, cohort of the Indigenous um, Data Hub Fellowship, we looked for students who are either living in Evomoku or have an ancestral connection to Evomoku. Um, we looked and saw, uh, we looked, actually first we looked for, and we created Pilina, or connections with community organizations and practitioners that are from Evamoku, who may have been interested in data visualization or data science, um, and, or interested in working with us to raise their capacity in that. And then we saw they had to be able to, or had a practice of perpetuating some ancestral knowledge and practice. So with Shaylin at the end, she's one of our Indigenous Data Hub fellows, so she's gonna go more into it, and you're gonna see how the, um, her particular project kind of held these uh, main components in action. But our base practice goes from creating a relationship with community partners through the sharing the intentions of our work. We develop the relationship and we help facilitate the relationship between students, faculty, um, and other community members. We try to design and through, or through to co-design, we design together what 
visualization or what maybe data science related capacity building could be needed for that community partner and the student starts to do research about how to fill and design goes through a design process of how to help with that um, capacity issue and then we go and we continue designing and working with our partners um, community partners until we've established it uh, we have a completed technology but more importantly through this whole experience we're allowing students to have connections with community members that maybe they haven't been able to um, have haven't been able to create that connection in the first place we are able to allow them uh, to get more familiar with their own Aina by working in areas that maybe they were never able to go to or they never even heard of because they would never had the opportunity before to go there. And then also through this, we we're able to give operational funding to our community partners because through this agreement of raising students together, we we're able to provide that funding to them. So. As I mentioned, we have a couple of different student development programs that I'll go through very quickly. The first is Partnerships for Pu'uloa. This was our summer um, internship project that happens, it's happened twice now. We had our second cohort this last summer, and we, uh, it's from a NOAA earmark, and we worked with Hui'o Ohonua, who was rest restoring Pu'uloa, or what maybe you guys would recognize as Pearl Harbor. And so, again, thinking of those four main components of the student development program, these students were taught um, bioculture restoration, they had field days, but they also learned data visualization and um, data management practices that culminated in a ho'ike where they learned and used the Makavalu visualization environment to both um, map the data that they've learned um, through whatever uh, work process that, or work site that they worked with, with Huyo Ho'ohonua, and then they also mapped their own relationship to place to build a stronger familiarity with Eva Moku. I kind of already um, mentioned the indigenous data hubs. So as I said, we're based in Crate X, but we're actually working to build one out at Leeward Community College, and which is um, where our first cohort um, was from. So through that process of creating uh, the Leeward um, uh, LCC IDH, is basically this cohort is a year-long um, process. We basically hire students as if they're, um, they're research assistants. And through this process, we worked with LCC admin to designate a space for them, which is right now under construction. We engage with LCC faculty to see um, where they could um, help the students and help mentor the students, as well as we also reached out to other community partners like Ulukoa. Um, to see if there was a potential project that they could work on with the students. And then when we developed the fellows program, we developed a program where they're meeting with these faculty. They're actually, we also got them other mentors, um, which was Kuhao, you guys know Kuhao, uh, Solomon Enos and Miki Ala uh, Lidstone from Ulua'e to help teach Kuhao, help t uh, teach indigenous design practice. Solomon, uh, help teach indigenous creativity, and then Mikiala helped teach community design. And so through this um, first cohort, um, we had three projects, um, uh, we had three projects from this cohort, which I'll explain a little later, and then you guys will see Shaylin's project. Um, but through, the, um, through this process, we're hoping to continue to support students on this uh, experience to both them to get self-actualization as they're um, learning how they can utilize whatever skills they're getting from their vocation, pair it with data uh, science skills, so that by the end of their cohort and by the end of the student development processes, as I said, they know exactly how they can engage with their community, as well as um, having this ecosystem where we can provide capacity for community through te uh, technology co-design and uh, support, financial support. So this is a couple of pictures from the Ho'ike that the first cohort just had uh, last, no, September. So I'm gonna move towards the technology. So again, this is the project table, which was de first developed at the Laboratory for Advanced Visualization Applications. It actually was first used to um, visualize renewable energy data at the Hawaii State Energy Office. Um, but since then, we've this, we, we found that it was very helpful for HSEO and HECO 
but we wanted to start to think through of how can we create the software um, back end to be more generalizable so that anyone could use it, not just that it was hard coded for um, Kiko and HSEO. So that's when we started um, the development of the Makovalu visualization environment, which essentially is um, the software that's used on these tables to create the kinds of visualizations that I've shown already in videos and that you're going to see in these demos. And it's all created through the Unity game engine because that is some, uh, excuse me, that is a program that a lot of students are learning in uh, their video game design classes. So actually, you guys should know the uh, definition for Makavalu because Kuhal explained it better. But when um, creating this technology, we were inspired actually by the pop uh, Papaku Makavalu process and um, Kuhal's teachings, essentially. And so the intention is for this um, technology to have that multi-perspective of um, visualization. Thus, we uh, call the software Makavalu Visualization Environment. So as I said, there are three versions, the editor, the author, and the presenter. I'm going to go really quickly so that I can, we can move on and hear from the students. But the editor tools are essentially tools within Unity that were created so that you could easily create and generate UI for the um, visualization. But the author and presenter tool are tools that um, Tracy is going to explain to, to create basically um, these visualizations um, from just inputting your own um, geospatial data into it. The Makovalu editor was the editor um, was the version that was used through our cohort programs, um, both in the two cohorts for Pu'uloa, which was the first two design phases, and then for our IDH fellowship. And to talk about the three projects really quickly that were from the IDH fellowship, but if you want more details, we were actually on the news. And so they did uh, highlights of all of us, um, all of the projects there. But the three projects are the Mo'olalo mapper, which is a way to visualize um, Kiao Mele Mele specifically. But that's working with Kumu um, Ui um, Keli Ikuli, who teaches Hawaiian mythology from a mental health and wellness perspective. There's Kipuko Okohina Hina, which is Shailen's project, so I'll let her explain that. And then there's the Ho'okele table, which was um, created uh, by, with, um, in collaboration with Ke Kai Lee, who is also a faculty at uh, Leeward Community College, uh, teaching navigation. And the table is meant to um, help teach sail plans and uh, basic navigation practices. But I'm going to turn it over to Tracy to talk more about the author and presenter. And so um, I'll hand you over. Okay, um, hi, my name is Tracy, and I'll be talking about what I've been developing, which is the Makovalu VE authoring tool and the Makovalu VE presenter tool. So the Makovalu VE authoring tool was primarily made with um, non-developers in mind. Um, it, this tool allows users to create their own project table without having the need to write code in the back end. And so um, it is a step-by-step -step process which allows users to basically guide them through how to make um, their own project information, um, set up their base layer information, as well as um, entering and loading in multiple data layers. Uh, as users add in their information, this information can be viewed in real time in the authoring tool. Um, basically showing their data progressing over time of what they're adding, and they can see it um, like a table preview of it within the authoring tool before adding it to the presenter tool. And then all of this user data um, is loaded and generated into JSON files, which are then also structured into their respective um, data layer folders, which you'll see later on. Um, and then once the user is done compiling all of their uh, data into this authoring tool, the project will then compile it and bundle it into a folder, which will then be loaded into the presenter tool, which I'll show both demos later on. 
And as for the Makavalu presenter tool, this tool essentially opens that folder that you just created in the authoring tool, and it reads in and validates all of the JSON files, the related data layer images that they just uploaded, uploaded as well as um, media files. And once properly validated, it will pipeline it into the project and then allocate it to the touchscreen display and the um, projection table display down below. And then currently we accept uh, static or time-based data layers, which I will also show. Okay. Now I'll be running you through the uh, Makovalo VE authoring demo. Um, so this demo is just basically, basically me showing you how to set up a general um, project as a non-developer user. So this is me just creating the project information, so just general information of what you'd name your project as well as a description to reference later on. And then now I'm filling in the um, base map information as well as uh, what kind of base map I will use um, under all, underneath all of the data layers. So here I choose Oahu. And then next, I'm filling in multiple data layers. And the first one I'm filling in is agriculture. And you can see I fill in the name, the description, the credit. Um, I'm choosing its color. I'm filling in the uh, icon image I want it to be, as well as um, I'm adding in five sublayers. And these layers are all geospatial data layers that um, we've processed through QGIS. And now I'm filling in a government data layer and doing the same thing. And you can see on the right, it's slowly starting to fill in um, the table preview of what it looks like. And it will potentially look like on the um, actual display later on. And then now I'll be going through what um, the compiled folder that I just made into the Makovalo VE presenter demo. So this is me just opening the folder that I just created from the um, Makovalo VE authoring tool. And once it's loaded in, it's going to populate onto the touchscreen display just like this. So you can see um, all four data layers that I kind of uploaded earlier. And I'm going to just run through them and all of their features. So the features right now we have is um, static data layers, which is um, right here. You can see the five data layers. And we also have a transparency feature, which will be seen in the government layer. And then the wild file data layer um, is go iterating through um, time-based data, which is year-based. And then this is what it looks like on the touch, uh, the table display. So this is just me toggling through different um, data layers, and you'll see it in action. Um, and that concludes the demo portion of the Makovalo VE authoring tool and presenter tool. I'll now pass it down to Marissa to talk about um, the designing standards, designing standard UI components. Um, hi everyone, I'm Marissa and I um, recently joined this project. Um, my main task was to create a demo for the Hawaii Climate Data Portal but um, part of that, or included in that project, was um, a task of designing standard UI components. So um, in my use case, I built off of a uh, asset in the Unity Asset Store that can be used as a standardized um, smooth interaction for time-based uh, data. So it is used in the demo that I will be showing on that table. 
in a moment. And it is was also shown in Tracy's presenter tool demo that you guys just saw earlier. And um, the purpose of having these components is to make the process, um, or I guess the design of the uh, UI elements or the interface to be more standardized so that it does look good on for any project that anybody makes. And so I would like to then go to the, oh, the live demo. So I will, I guess I, first I'll explain the use case of this um, the Makavalu virtual or visualization environment in the case of the Hawaii Climate Data Portal. So currently in the um, bottom left corner right here, you can see that this is their current web portal, which shows um, statewide data. Um, the data that they show includes rainfall as well as uh, temperature and it shows historical monthly rainfall as well as annual future predictions for rainfall and temperature. So for my demo, I chose to focus on rainfall and mean temperature. The data portal does show um, more temperature data such as the uh, max temperature as well as the minimum temperature, but I decided to just showcase um, the mean temperature. Um, so you can see on this right picture, this is um, building off of the Makavalu um, visualization environment where um, you can control the, what data is shown on two different maps. So this uh, dual island interface will allow you to quickly compare um, two different data types or um, the same data type but with different times and that is quicker than the HTTP web portal because it only allows you to view one data type at a time and you will have to constantly refresh. So this demo is, I guess, a way for you to quickly compare um, the different data. So if we could go over to the live demo. Okay, cool. So um, currently, uh, I'm not sure if everyone can see this, but this is the current setup of the touchscreen interaction. So there is, um, the interface is split. So the left side uh, UI components are meant for the left map here, and then the right side is for the right map. And so uh, it is the data is split between historical data as well as future data. So the historical window will only show uh, monthly data. So here you can see that um, this shows the monthly rainfall in January in 1990. And this data will go all the way to um, 2023. So if I w want to compare um, January 2023, Rain, monthly rainfall to um, January 1990, you can see the difference between um, how much rainfall we're getting now compared to before, especially in this mountain range and um, on the west side. So you can see the west side has definitely become drier over the years. And um, you can also compare the rainfall to the temperature. So the monthly mean temperature of Sorry, let me um, scroll all the way back to 1990 so that I can compare the same time but different data types. So here you can see the um, rainfall for January 1990 as well as the um, temperature. So you can um, develop quick decisions by being able to compare them side by side without having or compared to just seeing it one at a time. I also, um, oh, by the way, this data is pulled straight from their portal, so I um, have made it so that it is Oahu-centric, so the islands are not competing with um, the collect or data collection of other islands. And then um, 
when you switch to future prediction data, it will reset the table projection and then allow you to view the different um, scenarios that uh, the Hawaii Climate Data Portal uh, showcases on their portal. And so you can compare like the annual rainfall for the with a downscaling method, which is how they, um, it's a specific method that uses either uh, models that HTTP develops or uh, past statistics to determine or to predict how much rainfall you will have at um, this current year as well as the late century, which is within the years of 2070 to 2099. So we can see, we can compare, let's say the present. So this is the predicted annual rainfall for this year. And I can compare that quickly with, um, by looking at the best case. So you can see that um, in the best case scenario, this is where we do as much as we can to prevent uh, climate change. And so you can see that if we do start to change um, policies now related to climate change, the um, change in annual rainfall will not be that much. But if I show you what it looks like um, in the worst case scenario, oh, I guess that's, that's not a great example. But um, <laughs> I can, um, there are, if this is using the dynamical, which uses the models that they have uh, come up with, but if we look at the statistical, also is not um, very clear. But um, if we look at the absolute change, so this shows a lot more um, information. So here you can see the scale of how much rain you will lose um, in the future, which is 2070 to 2099. So you can see along the mountain ranges, you are losing around 31 inches of rainfall um, in comparison to how much we have. So the current uh, at or range of rainfall that we have is 2.5 inches to 278.5 inches. But go if we do nothing and we continue as we are, then we will lose around 31.5 inches in a lot of the mountainous areas. And the data also um, pulled from them also shows the um, annual mean temperature. So this is the um, best case scenario where if we do change our policies now, we will only be increasing about 2.8 degrees Fahrenheit, but if we do nothing, we will end up uh, increasing our, the temperature by 6.75 degrees Fahrenheit, almost statewide. So this kind of can tell the story that um, we do need to change how the, our current policies are related to our environment. And that concludes my demo. Okay, if we could go back to the presentation. So uh, overall, the overall or overall, the intentions for Makovalu visualization environment is so that, as you see, what um, Tracy and Marissa has worked on, they're working on different features, base features, um, using um, different data sets um, from partners as um, there we go, as different partner from different partners as ways to um, start creating features that can be utilized by other community partners um, to help with strategic planning, to help with um, figuring out and um, being additive to their practice. Overall, we hope that all um, future Makovalu visualization environment projects are co-designed with community and faculty so that they can both visualize both analytical and creative data narratives. So as I said, to aid in uh, this uh, science communication, uh, data visualization, and strategic planning. And 
Um, as time passes, we hope to not only just use the project table, but create, and the purpose of the Indigenous Data Hub and uh, Create X is to create other visualization technologies that can be um, useful to our community um, partners. So we're gonna talk about the practice and technology in action. Um, I know we're a little bit over time just because we've been a little uh, bit ahead of time, so bear with us <laughs> in which we're gonna go to the last uh, section, but I think it's the most important section because we're gonna see what uh, actually the uh, visualization uh, vis Makavalu has looked like when, work, um, when out working in the community. So um, if we do have the time, I have a 10 minute video with Ulukoa explaining the context, and then I wanna hand it over for, uh, to Shaylin to give uh, a final 10 uh, minute presentation, if that's okay. Okay. So, actually, so as I mentioned, Ulukoa is an archeologist in Kumuhula. He graciously um, came to work with us when um, our usual process is we invite um, community partners to create X and we have a conversation to see if anything uh, we have at the lab could be of use for them. And then we basically al allow the community partners to take the lead in the purpose, the intention, and the timing of how we de develop the technologies. Um, we matched him with Shaylin because Shaylin has an interest that she'll uh, speak about in uh, data science and visualization. So I'll play this video and let Ulukoa kind of explain the design context for this project. So our, our halau ki awe kupo no kaua, um, we created um, kaui hio kapo, um, which is one of our, our um, NHOs outside of the halal, but yet it's with the halal. Um, because we also do advocacy work um, over at the, um, the regional Pacifica level and, and the global indigenous level at the UN and such, and we wanted to make sure that we keep the halal name separate and just for, uh, you know, that practice, that practice the, all everything connected with the hula and then Outside of that, you know, we, we you know, we work with our Ka'ui Hia Kapo, which is a glimmer of light, you know, in the darkness, you know. And um, so with Ka'ui Hia Kapo, we also have other community members from Honokai Hale, the Kapolei area, and Makakila going down, down the coast that they join us in our efforts, so, um, the community. Um, and then we also have a, a sibling group, but it's actually part of us as well, is Ho'ola Hani'o. And that group is our Malamavai portion. And some people are more involved on that side. Um, our traditional fishery is Hani'o. So um, those folks are also part of us. So within with regards to the the Aina side of the Kipuko Kahina Hina and our Ko'at Kahe, and then you have the Hani'o fishing grounds and all of that is supported by folks from the Department of Land and Natural Resources and folks from the Division of Aquatic Resources and um, different marine biologists from uh, UAH and then we have the state botanists and their team and so all of these different um, scientific specialists, they're all um, with us. And just recently, we've added some hydrologists from the um, Water Resource Research Center. And so they've, they're uh, lending their expertise to help us uh, monitor the water quality. So the Kipuka, um, it's been an ongoing agreement with the uh, city and county of Honolulu uh, environmental um, uh, refuse refuse division um, because they have a uh, a convenience center next door and a, um, a garbage truck um, yard. But <clears throat> anyways, it's an agreement to uh, take care of their um, endangered plant sanctuary for the uh, Evahina Hina, um, which has a very limited habitat. Uh, it's endangered. I think the only other place is on the ridges of Makaha. But otherwise, it used to be more profuse. And now it's just down to like so many specimens, you know, not a big population. 
Uh, so that's the main um, um, reason why we were able to, or they were able to fence it off and um, keep that as a sanctuary. When we got into an agreement to take care of the place, the Eva Ihinahina went down to, it was already one specimen. It was like, like a bare branch, like the Lorax from Dr. Seuss, kind of like dead, couple dead leaves at the bottom. And then, you know, uh, with care and the out planning from um, the state botanist, Susan Chang, she brought some seeds in and we brought it up to um, nine specimen and they're like, they're thriving, they're huge, just just coming out of the, the tops of the sinkholes and, and um, you know, she, she shares with us, you know, we go over there like on a weekend, like off time from her schedule and she says she wished that there are more community groups that would help them in their efforts because, um, and I'm paraphrasing, uh, she was saying it's such a burden for their team, so understaffed, to have all these en different endangered plants that they need to um, restore and protect from extinction. And so it's been a really nice uh, uh, partnership with them. It's, it's so fitting that when you look at the landscape and that you see it's just a, a barren, very uh, harsh landscape relatively speaking, right? You don't see any above ground streams and you don't see a lush um, uh, forest like you do in uplands, right? And the sun is, you know, really strong. Um, but if you look below the surface, right? Literally and figuratively, you see the that these sinkholes um, are there and so then what does what do the sinkholes mean? What were what was the significance of these sinkholes? And then we go into the other uh, the other things of the other thoughts of Kalua Mahi and uh, Kalua um, Kalua Vai um, sinkholes as water access points and sinkholes as um, uh, vital agri agricultural plots that held extra moisture and shade during the day you know, for, for crops. Uh, inviting um, the OIKI folks to come out, you know, and along with the Creatix, you know, space, come out and see, and then see exactly what we're doing and see, you know, it was for their staff to see if it was possible to um, support and collaborate, you know, with us. And so we're super happy that after, you know, we showed them around and showed them what we we're doing and talk about what kinds of help we needed regarding uh, data collection and technology and, and, um, and being able to show how our work is impacting the area, you know. Uh, after many discussions, you know, um, we we're able to. Oh, actually, it was it was Shailen under the under the leadership of Carrie Noy. Shailen Noy, uh, Lou was the fellow, right? To to say, okay, maybe if we can uh, create this um, data collection app, um, that could help. So then it took. Um, without even first doing the app, actually getting the hands into the aina, right? And planting, they, you know, they, they helped us actually open the sinkholes, some of the sinkholes and actually plant in them and help us mulch some of the, the vegetation that we, uh, the invasives that we, we cleared off and, and using that to, to, uh, to plant, you know? And then, and so, really becoming more intimately familiar with the kipuka. And then from there, using that experiential knowledge and coming up with this application and, and it was a lot of back and forth correspondence, like, you know, what data fields to include in the collection process and, 
and in what order, what would be the best way to to make it flow really um, really easy in the field. And then, um, so it was a lot of back and forth, and then, then coming up and inputting all of that and actually showing it uh, using uh, the projector and uh, the computer and then a, a 3D model, just unbelievable. Um, you know, this really helps us to be able to show um, um, others and future potential partners, but also uh, within our network to kind of like, as we graph things, as we expand the Eva Hina Hina population, as we expand and plant more uh, Noni and Ulu and Kukui and Ilima and Ko and others and, and Uwala on the outside, as we, as we plant more and it'll show up on our data, data visualization. And this is really important when we uh, look for uh, stronger uh, means of support, whether that means funding or more scientists, or even if we can show what we're doing and how it, uh, how it impacts the water, um, you know, all of these, this kind of information can, can even help, you know, in the future with regards to policy, you know. When you look at, you zoom out, you look at the big picture, you know. Um, here I am going to the, the uh, UNFCCC um, Conference of Parties, climate change talks. And we're talking about how do we get better um, food sustainability, food security, in, in times of, you know, more intense weather patterns and uh, the uh, less groundwater recharge and, you know, all of those things. So, you know, all of this can have uh, a stronger impact as we, we figure out, okay, how, how can we use this traditional knowledge to make the land fruitful again, you know, in cases of uh, better food security, better food sustainability at our fingertips, you know, and if the water, you know, what's the, what's the quality of water right now? And how can we make that clean again so that the Opai Ula come back? You know, and knowing that traditionally this was the access water, you know, points for water, you know, back when we didn't have the water pumping all over the island, in the case of a natural disaster or a man-made disaster and the pumps do not work again, you know, to be able to have water access points from these sinkholes again, you know, until the water pumps can co come back up, you know. So um, the impacts are uh, countless and um, very powerful impacts uh, thanks to, to the help of the um, Office of Indigenous Knowledge and Innovation and their fellowship program um, supporting us and making, making this uh, um, helping us to visualize this that we can share with others. Okay. Now I'm going to turn it over to Shaylin to talk a little bit more about what uh, she developed when uh, Uluko was talking about the visualization environment that um, they co-designed together. So Shaylin, would you come up? Aloha my kako, my name is Shaylin Liu. Um, I am one of the Indigenous Data Hub Fellows working on the project of the Kipuka Okahina Hina uh, Data Visualization Project. Um, and I'm also a undergrad junior studying computer science and data science at UH Manoa. So a bit of context for Kipuka Okahina Hina. There are three main pillars that we should um, keep in our minds and hearts as we enter this space. These three pillars, they were touched on in the video, Kalua Olohe, Kalua Vai, and Kalua Mahi. So Kalua Olohe is the actual sinkhole landscape itself, and more specifically, it is the combination of the landscape with indigenous knowledge. Um, as was said in the video, if you lack this indigenous knowledge, it's very easy to gloss over um, the sinkhole landscape and how much value it holds 
because it can just look like a dry, arid wasteland. And without that indi indigenous knowledge and knowing how to apply it into that space, um, you just wouldn't see the value that lies there. Uh, next is Kaluavai. Kaluavai are the sinkholes that have access to subterranean waters. Um, and these spaces, these Kalua, they would provide uh, the people of the Honouliuli area access to clean water. Um, since, as we know, it's a very dry, arid um, environment. And as recounted by many kupuna in the area, this water was traditionally, it was extremely clean, and this was noted by the presence of the Opai Ula. Um, they're no longer there. There have been multiple issues um, with trenching and contamination and stuff. But the overarching goal of the Kipuka is to be able to restore these Kaluavai to the state they once were and be able to bring the Opai Ula back. Lastly is Kaluamahi. These are the sinkholes where um, sinkhole agriculture is practiced. Um, and it's a very fruitful and bountiful um, method of agriculture, as mentioned with Ulukoa's Avahinahina story. So a bit about this project, we wanted to be able to offer a visualization experience um, that starts out in the field and goes out into presentations and meetings or whatever whatever you need this tool for. So the general timeline is the user goes out into the field, they go and they collect their data, they input it into a form which then can be exported. Um, in this case, we export it as a JSON file to then populate into the visualization environment. And from there, all that data you collected out in the field, it can now be presented um, with this visualization environment for others to see. So, we currently just finished our first project iteration um, and we will be entering our second quite soon. Um, and there were a couple different features developed throughout this first iteration, but the, the main ones that I will be focusing on is the data collection form and the data comparison feature. So the data collection form, it was done using a third party app called EpiCollect5 and the data comparison feature uses the Makavalu visualization environment. So this is what the system looks like as a whole. You guys have already seen a video demo of this, but it consists of the back projection, which is what the data comparison um, feature displays on, as well as different cultural components can be displayed there. There's also a base layer um, table projection of the overall map of the Kipuka space, and then the touchscreen UI, which controls it all. So, to talk a bit about the data form design process, um, it started with an initial brainstorm of what um, data points we thought would be helpful um, when going out into the field and wanting to collect data on this. From there, we went to our experts, we went to Ulukoa, we asked him for feedback, his input, and from there we made the um, appropriate modifications to get our first baseline form. What we would then do is we would go down to the Kipuka and um, apply it in the field. We would go there, test the form, see what worked, see what didn't work, take notes on what needed to be improved and make the appropriate modifications. Just some examples of things that we would have to update about. Um, first is being able to distinguish between Kalua Mahi and Kalua Vai. So the data points within these different types of sinkholes, they're very different and many of them don't overlap. And as we went out into the field, we noticed there was a redundancy in going through the form filling out experience when if you're filling out something about Kalua Mahi, you really don't need to see any of the components on Kalua Vai. So that was a modification we made. Another one is um, as computer scientists, I don't have any expertise in um, um, the type of work that Ulukoa does. And one of the things that um, we had to adjust is that we knew we wanted a picture component for the sinkholes, but we didn't realize that archaeology archaeologists, they do plan and profile view. That's another thing we had to update and learn as we went out into the field. And lastly, from our most recent visit, we realized that essentially there are two types of data that you will be collecting, which is static versus changing data. And what I mean by this is that if you're going out into the field and collecting data on a Kalua Mahi, you 
won't necessarily need to take data on some of the things twice. For example, if you just restore Kalua Mahi, you take sinkhole or excuse me, soil type, soil texture, all those things, they won't change the next time you come back. So there's no need for you to have to refill that information. However, things that might change are the plants planted in that Kalua Mahi, as well as the status of them. So being able to create two forms and two separate databases for a more concise user experience is something that we will improve on. Now to talk about the data com comparison design process, this started out with a paper prototyping of the user experience, which you can see a bit of on the top. And basically what paper prototyping is, it's kind of breaking down your process step by step to fully understand what you want to create and what you want to implement. And by going through this, you get a clear understanding of what your goal is. And in my case, it helped me figure out um, some redundancies that I had to work on. For example, an initial design that I had is having an explicit comparison button, which you can actually see in the paper prototyping. But after going through it, I realized there are a lot of redundancies and uh, unnecessary things within what I was expecting within this button. Um, so I went ahead and slicked it down to what the current implementation is, which is essentially a long and short hold data feature toggle in which if you press on a data entry for a long time, it will essentially lock it into a place on the back projection, which you can then do quick taps on other data entries to kind of prompt it up as a comparison feature. So some intentions for iteration two, as I mentioned, updating the database for static versus changing data, as well as creating a process to standardize data collection as a whole. The more we go back and the more we visit and collect data, we realize in order to make comparison aspects more concise, there should probably be a standardized way to go about collecting this data. Also, we wish to be able to expand the scope of this project, not to just focus on the kipuka, but also be able to go out into the scope of evamoku and be able to toggle between that. And what that brings is essentially new data that can be visualized, such as larger things as watersheds and other kalua and cultural sites within evamoku. So some of the takeaways that I had on this iteration is understanding the significance of data collection in the field. As I mentioned, I am a data science student, and in classes, it's very common that you will just be given a large Excel sheet of data, and you're just told clean, process, and run models on it. But with that approach, it's very easy to lose understanding of the value of the data that you're very easily given. Throughout this process, I had to go down to the kipuka, I had to work with the LAN, I had to collect that data myself. So I feel that moving forward as a data scientist, knowing and understanding this appreciation is something I can take forward with me in my career. Another thing that I was able to take away from this is experiencing project design and implementation cycles that are, that are more traditional towards computer science, which allows me to enhance myself as a computer science student. And what I mean by this is that the actual working with the project, it involves many files, many components, much pre-written code that I then had to go in and understand in order to be able to add um, my own features on it. And that's a structure that is very common within computer science um, careers. You're usually not there from the start. Someone has already made something. You have to be able to go in, understand it, and work with something that is very large and, mul and has multiple files. So I feel like that was good career experience for me, as well as experience more traditional computer science work models such as project sprints. But Lastly, I would say a huge takeaway on this was the integration of culture and career. As I mentioned, I got a lot out of this career-wise and skill-wise in that um, aspect, but there was a lot of integration of culture that I was able to experience. Um, as a native Hawaiian in computer science, something that I kind of had, that I felt like I really had to face going into this field is that I felt there wasn't a lot of space for indigenous models and ideas within the career space I wanted to work in. However, within the specific scope of the project, 
we used a lot of indigenous frameworks, indigenous mindsets, a lot of intent when creating this project. So I was able to take the values that I've been taught growing up and be able to use my technical skill skills within my career and integrate the two, which is very nice um, because I feel like it's able to satisfy both parts of who I am, both culturally and who I am as a native Hawaiian, but also who I am as a computer scientist. So I will now be passing it back to Kari for closing remarks. Thank you. OK. And with that, we we're at the end of our um, presentation. Thank you so much for the patience. We had a little rocky start. The microphones did not like me. So I'm sorry we're keeping you from lunch a little longer. But I hope from this presentation, um, you're able to take with you kind of the intentions we had when um, designing the Indigenous Data Hubs, an appreciation for all the hard work these three put into for their different parts <laughs> and what they've designed and developed. And yeah, and just our future goals as we go on trying to expand the Indigenous Data Hub. We're in talks of expanding it also to uh, Kauai Community College and uh, Kohala as well, bringing it to other communities so we can expand both the technological capacity and the things that we're developing with our partners like At Lava and Hawaii um, Creati Creativity and Tech. No, Hawaii uh, Creativity and Technology, yes. And also, um, what we would like to, kind of the experience we'd like to build so that our students here in Hawaii can have an experience where they, whatever vocation they are, they are have, they can have a, a safe eco, innovation ecosystem so that they can express uh, their own indigenous culture. So mahalo and let's go eat lunch. <laughs>